Welcome back to the Mom Mentality Show. My name is Austin Chadwick and co-host is Chris Lucian. And today we're uh, excited and happy to have on our show today, uh, Swati Swoboda and uh, Sheldon Nunes. And uh, they're going to be sharing about several things today. Uh, they kind of have a uh, mob pro programming story at Shopify that they're going to share about. And then they'll also be talking uh, about digital by default and how they do their prototyping. Um, uh, but before we jump into those topics, uh, maybe we can have uh, each of you introduce yourself and we'll start with you, uh, Sheldon. Yep. Hi, everyone. My name is Sheldon. Uh, I'm a software developer at Shopify um, and I'm actually based in New Zealand, working for the company based in Canada, which is a really, really awesome opportunity. And uh, in my spare time, I love to uh, play saxophone. Um, I'm an avid uh, music uh, musician and also love board games. I can see some board games behind uh, your, uh, your desk there. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Swati Saboda. I'm a dev manager here at Shopify. I've been here for four years. I'm based out of Ontario, Canada. That's amazing that Sheldon and I have worked together because he's all the way in New Zealand. I also love board games and contemplating moving my office to the board game room I have downstairs. And I have uh, three kids at home, which keep me pretty busy. All right. The board on. game office is highly recommended, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Right on. Well, I guess we can jump right into it. You know, uh, we noticed um, basically the blog post uh, sharing about your mob programming experience, and we thought it'd be fun to have you on the sh show and talk about it. So, uh, yeah, maybe if one of you wants to kick us off with uh, you know, your story and how you started mobbing and how's, how's it been going? Yeah, it started in a coffee chat, right? right? Like we have the we had these informal coffee chats booked. Where, you know, when you come in the work in the morning, first thing, everybody wants to like not work, but just chat, say hello and all those. And we all stepped in, it's like uh, looking at this task that's in front of us that none of us really all know how to do. Maybe collectively we did. So up until then, we had a lot of back and forth in PRs, et cetera, and not making progress. And then someone went, hey, Sheldon, this mob programming thing, maybe we should try it. Uh, and Sheldon was the one who introduced us to it, right? Yeah, that, that's right. I actually had some experience with mob programming in my previous company. And at, at the previous company, that was actually co-located. We had one room with a, with a massive TV. Um, and so I wasn't sure if it was going to work in this digital environment, but we, we just thought, like, what the hell? We'll, we'll, we'll just uh, join into a, a huddle and, and give it a try. Um, and, yeah, we, we saw some, like, real benefits from it. Uh, but I think it was a lot of uh, nervousness or, or, or like unknown, like not showing like what's the proper code or structure of how to do it. Um, and I think that was kind of just taking what we had learned from my previous company and applying it here. Um, so like what I really liked is that it was very much a natural organic process. We, we kind of jumped in and it's like, okay, like we've started with just one person coding and everyone's just watching. And eventually people are like, okay, like this isn't working. We're not engaged. Let's. Uh, I think Swati. I think it was you who was like, okay, like let's. Oh, it change was Debra. Oh, it, it was Debra, right. and she goes, "Hey, Sheldon, how do we make sure that people don't fall asleep?" <laughs> yeah. And that's what she had asked. How do we make sure that people don't fall asleep? Which was just a perfectly timed question. And it, it was. Uh, yeah. It was the make or break moment because I think people were, were starting to fall asleep, definitely. <laughs> um, and so then we added in. Uh, I think it was a ten-minute timer, so it was going to be you've got your one driver coding and then after that time we're going to cycle through um, and of course you can decide not to take it and still be a navigator and be part of that discussions um, and yeah like that completely changed the process for us I think it like a little light bulb in everyone's head and, and we, we just got into the zone it was fantastic and then we ended up doing it that whole day and then every day too we started the last taking lessons like oh it gets tiring after four hours people let's not do it for four hours <laughs> and uh maybe you know pause after two hours so we can so we can recharge we all learned that we were introverts that day <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it's for me it's really fascinating because as you improve the the mob it becomes less of a problem about coding and more about communicating. Like, mm -hmm. and that's where that fatigue comes in is like, how do we maintain that communication in both a thoughtful way and then communicating at the level that is understood by the current driver? Because obviously you've got different levels of skill of the driver. Um, and then also like, yeah, how, how do I make sure that I'm not going to be exhausted by the end of this is, is key. Yeah. yeah. Well, nice. One thing that I, I've, uh, I, I wanted to jump back to real fast that I find really fascinating 
I love the fact that we can interview people on this show and hear that their previous job was mob programming and then they went to a new job and started mob programming. <laughs> so I think that that was less common a few years ago, but now I'm hearing that more often. So it was kind of a cool little thing. Nice, nice. Right on. Yeah. And I guess one question I had that was a little bit was, um, was there any um, catalyst or, you know, things that before you started mobbing problems you have that you're trying to solve with this experiment? And uh, what problems did it solve? What problems did it not solve? You know, um, uh, you know, what was your mindset going into it, I guess? Yeah. Making progress on that PR that we were mobbing on, right? Because Deborah had been working on it for a while. And uh, the complaint was that we're not getting feedback and she wasn't getting feedback because most of the people were new to the space and we're like none of us really know what this is and we can ask those hundred questions in the pr what is this what is this what is this what is this and then make progress or you know or maybe do the thing and hop on a call but it was just so daunting and overwhelming that no one was doing that mm -hmm. uh, so we needed to sit together and like walk through and be able to ask those questions so it was it was it was not so much that we were almost like a, like shipping a PR, but we were actually onboarding the six people who had joined the team. It's like this this is what we're actually working on, people. It was an onboarding thing, and and that's what it kept becoming the whole time. It 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 wasn't a code review. It wasn't pairing. It was let me let's all of us learn together and actually collaborate. It's a collaboration exercise, and that's I think we learned that was a problem and we only learned that was a problem until we started solving it. <laughs> what are your thoughts, Sheldon? Yeah, I, I think it's much the same. Um, one thing that I, I really thought was interesting was how we had everyone join the, the mob programming and we were all from, from separate teams. Like we, we hadn't really had much contact up until that point. Like it, it had been very much like, I'm going to put a PR and these people who I, who I don't even know within the company are just going to, to review it. And so, yeah, it definitely broke down those, those borders like because we had our previous teams and we'd all just kind of all collaborated on this one project. So uh, not only was it great for de demystifying the domain we're working on and being able to like talk about it, but actually just to, to know each other, um, it's been great. Because now, now I know it's like, oh, okay, I, I definitely know people in my neighboring teams that I can reach out to if I ever need anything. Yeah. Uh, did it change the way that um, you communicated about cross-team work in general? Um, if, for example, do you have retrospectives about working together uh, across teams or anything along those lines that, that came out of this now that those borders were kind of broken down or, or was it just kind of like a natural thing that you, you got together and then, and then separated at the end? Like, how did that go? I definitely think that it did change the way in which I communicate with other teams. Like there's no doubt about that. Um, there has been opportunities to join huddles and, and mobs. It's great because uh, we, we use Slack uh, and Shopify, but one of the, you can actually see when, when they're huddling. And so I, it became common occurrence that I knew that when I saw that there was huddle, that there was a mob going on. And great thing is you can just join in. And there was a couple of times I did that. Um, but yeah, I, I would say it just changed the way you interact with those people in general. So I, I did find it improved the cross-team collaboration. Um, the, that being said, our, our team's um, missions and, are quite clear. And so we don't necessarily need to, we're not stepping on each other's toes all the time. So the collaboration is not minimal, but it is, it's manageable. Yeah. yeah. Nice. I think we also started leaning more into the open to default philosophy that we have at Shopify, right? Because the initial, first when we tried our mobbing session, it was a private Slack call or DM, right? Like it was a seven people thing and it was, and no one else could knew could join or, or leave because it was a DM. And then we're like, hey, let's make this a channel. But then we made it a public channel and random people around the company, like walking by would see and join just to like, okay, yeah, I had a few minutes and I'm going to step in. And then since then, I've seen most of the, uh, between the teams, because all our public, our channels are public across teams, a lot of them will often keep their uh, huddles and uh, calls public so that people can join instead of putting behind private meetings or just meetings even that are in Google Calendar. Yeah. It's very visible in Slack, which has allowed literally random people to join and random calls and provide random context, which is useful and learn useful context too. 
Well, this, uh, this is um this is kind of an, a thought that I had around going remote because we were in person before and then we went remote and in that process um one thing we, we were just like man the water cooler chat is just not happening there's no no way to do that remote and and so how do we simulate that and so we, we used to kind of do the the um the morning water cooler and open up a channel and, and people would join it um but uh, you know, things like lean coffees and, and having the, the teams visible to everyone and being able to move back and forth between you get that, you get that unplanned serendipity, like, you know, somebody comes in and said, Hey, I know something about that. This is what it is. Um, and, and so that, that spontaneous serendipity is something that you just don't get without that water cooler chat, but, but mobbing and, um, you know, open channels where people can join has, has really been uh, a way to keep that going in the, in the virtual environment, which is fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when someone's really stuck on like a problem and they need help and they don't even, sometimes you have a thing and you're like, I'm stuck, but I don't even know how to define what my problem is to ask you a question. I just need eyes on this. So we'll have people in the team and they'll just start I need help and it'll be a Slack call and people will randomly join. Okay, what is this? And all of a sudden there'll be like six of us staring at this hilarious thing and laughing and connecting and, and solving the, the apparent problem, which is yeah. exactly kind of what Office was. Yeah. And actually one point just to, to Chris, what you said is that the uh, that water cooler feel is like, and, and having that, that social time, I, I found that doing mob programming it was it was fun like you you you're not just coding you you're uh, you're having some laughs about problems that you're encountering while you're coding like I, it was an enjoyable experience it was it was social time as well as a work time um and yeah it was, it was really powerful for the team you played a lot of tic-tac-toe while waiting yeah. for things. <laughs> yeah, we, we, would, we, would draw, we would draw tic-tac-toe on the board while we're waiting for things to compile. I, I remember that. Yes. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, we, we usually uh, lately have a uh, running inside joke, like some mascot or some like public figure that will make part of all the test strings and stuff that we put in the code. And so that's... Uh, and then the gifts will start flying of that, whatever, whatever that mascot is. Uh, yeah. And uh, I wanted to highlight too, that um, the kind of what you're saying, digital by default and making things public. I've seen that serendipity happen a lot when you just do it publicly. Right. So a couple of examples that come to mind where um, uh, sometimes during, we have dedicated learning time. So we, uh, you know, we mob a lot of the time or almost all the time, but we have dedicated learning time and sometimes I'll be solo, but I'll just, jump in a room and do a public channel and then sometimes people just randomly join me and be like oh i saw you what were you doing in here and then they would join me with whatever i was learning or coding and um there's actually uh, an event that was happening where most of the people in our department were there and i saw someone had a public channel and i went and joined and they're like well i didn't go to this event because we have this issue and then i and someone else joined and then we started to fix the issue and we were on separate teams and it was just kind of a cool a cool moment um yeah, and so that that's um, that's fantastic. And maybe going back a little bit to your mob programming story, I had some follow up questions. And uh, you know, just you know, we mob program uh, almost full time, pretty much. And so, um, and we totally get people who do it part time. But I always love having discussions with people who find who said you know they found it exhausting, you know, to find out what experiments they ran and things like that. And so, yeah, maybe uh, the first question would be, uh, can you describe that uh, exhausting experience? You know, maybe. A, a salient event or things that led to that feeling of, uh, of exhaustion. <laughs> I, I found that in my team. Um, so I, I didn't experience that, but definitely people in my team mentioned that they felt quite exhausted after four hours or five hours mm -hmm. of mobbing and they needed that alone time to be able to process and think because um, sometimes some people just need to learn by clicking around things themselves and just think in peace without people talking all the time. And uh, in our team, what we ended up doing was make sort of like introverted Wednesdays where <laughs> we did <laughs> mob on Wednesdays to, to give people that space. Uh, but I definitely, I had several people in the team who are very intense introverts say that, yeah, that's a lot. I can't, I can't do that much mobbing. Um, another one, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on um, feedback. Some feedback that I got was like, it's really hard to know what an individual's contribution was when you're mobbing. Uh, and I find that interesting because 
as a manager, I was like, well, I kind of really only care about the team contribution. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I think so. <laughs> uh, but individuals cared about, it's like, okay, how do I know what I did? And it was like, well, you did the same thing the team did. Uh, but have you come across that? I'm curious. I, I think there's a couple of aspects. Um, one is the personal satisfaction. I wrote a blog a long time ago about personal satisfaction while mobbing. Um, and so it's like, you know, can you own the contribution? So, you know, the, the feedback I was getting was some people are saying, like, I used to make a feature and it was mine. And that was like, I could point to it and say, that was my feature. Um, and so, you know, that feeling kind of went away. And so, uh, you know, I, I thought about it a lot. And, and so in the blog, I kind of outlined this idea of your personal contributions are not necessarily the code base, like that's a collaboration. But when you think of something to help the team become a better team, like in a retrospective, like those are individual contributions that can that can modify the way the team works that then um, as an experiment. So, so you can say like, I made the team better. Like I, you know, so, so those were the types of things that I think came out. And of course that's also a collaboration and very fluid as well, but you get there kind of iteratively and it's a little bit more defined. Um, but, you know, while, while programming, um, you know, every every person's kind of verbalization of what they're thinking at the time is an individual contribution and that might even just spark an idea for someone else right and so um you know our uh you know for example people that ended up on patents that we would write uh we went from being like one person to like 12 <laughs> um just because there were so many contributing factors and everybody had like this one piece that they contributed to the architecture and some other thing um, and so, so I think personal satisfaction, personal contribution, the focus there should be how, how did this person think of a Kaizen event, a, a continuous improvement event for the team and then, and then the team contribution and, and, you know, so, so maybe judge things on the team based on the code base and output and, and then also focus on, on individuals, uh, awareness of, of how team collaboration can, can improve. And so you kind of balance yeah. That's kind of how I saw it, but definitely I didn't realize it was a skill that people had to build and how they see their contribution. Because yeah. uh, they're so used to seeing it by saying, oh, this PR and this PR, because it was a real thing. It's like, oh, let's make sure we add all the contributors to every PR, which is a pretty tedious process with GitHub. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, it doesn't really matter. It's a like team shipped together. <laughs> so, well, but yeah. One thing that I think really helped is we went to a peer nomination process for promotions. And so rather than the manager deciding initially, like how a person got promoted, the peers would nominate people for promotions. And so, so a lot of times it became, okay, the people in the mob are the ones that are kind of evaluating for, for like how, how engaged, how, how much you're con contributing and, and that built up. And so um, and I think that that also helped a lot because um, I think people are concerned about their visibility to the person promoting them. And so if you if that if the person promoting them can't see their individual contribution, then how will they be um, considered for a raise or promotion otherwise? And so uh, and that I think psychologically that can be really hard on a person. So so I think as long as the person who um, makes the decision on whether or not somebody gets promoted and is within can actually visibly witness those things those contributions then it's okay but when it's when when they can't see that and in the past it was I made this therefore it's my contribution and no one can take that from me um, and I think there's a lot of fear uh, sometimes around people taking credit for other people's work um, so yeah. Must have the reverse problem here. No one wants to take credit for the, the work <laughs> because it's, it's everyone did it together. So I don't know what I did. So what yeah. it's like, well, you made it happen as part of a team. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. The um, yeah, I think it's I think it's a shift for some people that it's just, I think there is still this team pride of like, hey, we made this as a team and we're excited about this feature or this innovation, you know, like. I know my team right now, we're really excited about an innovation we're working on. Um, and so there's some kind of collective pride. But as far as individual contr contribution goes, like I think it kind of shifts from that to like mastery. You know, am I mastering the skills and teaching other these skills, whether through mobbing or other ways, and coaching, like helping other people uh, grow. Um, and so I think it, it, it's, it's a shift in incentives. And because 
mastery and coaching are the things that really help get peer promotion uh, nominations. And um, one thing that you guys said earlier that I wanted to highlight was that people felt comfortable to say like, hey, I'm tired. I want, you know, no mobbing Wednesdays or whatever and those kind of things. And and that's great. It, it shows that there is a um, high enough uh, psychological safety to voice those kind of things. And I think at least for me, and I've seen that with others, is that when if, if you're working more collaboratively, be like mobbing or pairing, and to recognize people, you know, so in a retro to have a shout out or just one on one and say like, hey, when you brought up this idea that really brought us through and then people start getting the value, getting that, um, uh, you know, feeling their contribution because their peers are telling them, you know, that they're contributing, you know, and so, um, yeah, so that, that's some good stuff there. And so, um, yeah, so maybe on uh, kind of going full circle back to the exhaustion just a little bit is um, when you guys mobbed, where's their breaks? Um, or was it just like four hours straight? Um, how, how did you manage that? <laughs> I think when we initially started, we, we were just too excited. Like, like, I think the excitement was, was higher than our exhaustion. And so we just kept pushing through. So I, I think maybe the first week we were doing like full four hour sessions. Um, I'm curious to know from that, whether we did start adding the breaks, I don't recall. Um, but I do know that we, we then just had that time of like, hey, let's let's go from the morning to lunchtime and then we'll break and people can work individually after. We would do a retro after every mobbing session and then we did add breaks. We were like two hours and then lunch and then two hours after that and then people can then go off on their own. And now, which is almost like a year later, I, I, yeah, it's evolved to... Uh, people sort of because it's now everyone's mobbing across at least in my team and other teams who were part of that initial six group I see a lot of like one hour long sessions and a pause then uh, it's a we become better in that we're definitely more focused on the problems that we mob on uh, and it's a normally often very very purposeful instead of a, an ambiguous here's mob on this project uh, so typically now the mobbing sessions are like an hour uh, and kind of ad hoc uh, as well instead of pre-planned it's like that will mob today uh, so an hour is what I see now usually I'm curious Swati like for your team uh, when we're doing our sprint planning and we're trying to figure out what we're going to do for the week we try and identify like what are these what are the problems we could potentially mob on but does your team do the same no no the teams kind of self manage like some teams will mob every day uh, and mob multiple times a day. And then some other teams will mob once or twice a day, uh, so only when they're stuck. Um, and then some team, as a whole team, because you've got multiple projects, uh, then we will be like, okay, there's this this uh, almost attack that, that we really want to tackle that we've been ignoring, and we really want to work on it. And none of us, we all have different opinions on this, and we don't have a solution, so let's all mob on it. And then we'll book that one in advance and say, okay, here's a very specific mobbing session that's going across projects. And uh, that is kind of optional for people to attend when everyone attends. Uh, and that one is the only focused one. But for project-specific ones, it's just a habit now, like a you know, as you, as you were preparing or people just do it, type in call in Slack and you're done. It's nice. Right on. Yeah. I've definitely seen that too, where people find their own cadence uh, that works well for them. And so some people they'll stay on the mob call all day, but they'll be in and out or they'll be doing other things. So they'll be like, Oh, I can't drive for a while. Um, some people like lots of small breaks and some people like little to no breaks, but they're bigger, you know, and so, um, you know, finding that flow for each team is, is, is fantastic. And, uh, yeah. And then, uh, one other thing I wanted to highlight on mobbing, maybe before changing topics was, uh, uh, you all said you had, you struggled with, uh, what were they slow tests or something that was hard to mob? Is this oh. where the tic-tac-toe came in? Uh, <laughs> that's not, I think when the slow test was when we tried to color the whole screen before it faded, before it right because it would the paint would disappear <laughs> if you like go of your cursor. So it was a race to color the whole screen. Yeah. <laughs> on, 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 yeah, yeah, on some of the slow tests, uh, there was one test like it, it feel um, a couple of minutes in a mob is a very long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, and and that sort of thing is kind of expensive. I, I you know, when when teams experience stuff like that, I, I often encourage them to find out how to break up the project in such a way that 
you know, the tests don't depend on each other and other things along those lines. And so um, typically what we'll end up doing is like have breaking things out into libraries and things like that. Um, and uh, it, it's pretty effective, but um, it, yeah, it, it's, uh, there's also the com com camaraderie in, in dealing with something that's painful in, in a mob, right? Um, yeah. And I think at this point I'm spoiled by super fast tests. So we were just experiencing one today. We opened up an ancient project that we heard had been made by a third party and then changed hands several times. And it had tests, which is great, you know, but they were very slow tests and they didn't change a lot. And so me being spoiled, I was just like, I'm not even going to try to modify this test. We just wrote a new, you know, fast test because, you know, and so um, I think my my laziness to wait <laughs> has uh, changed that. So, yeah, I mean, I think. And so I think that's um, a thing that uh, maybe 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 it's a call out. Like if you feel like as a mob, I've heard that, you know, what you all said is that what I've heard before too is like, ah, we tried writing, you know, as a bunch of test engineers writing, you know, end to end tests together. And it was just too painful as a mob. And it's, it's kind of maybe while, maybe while you're waiting for the test to run, maybe have a retrospective conversation about what can we do to speed up the tests? You know, maybe it's just a, it's not a, a recommendation, but maybe a question to ask, a suggested question to ask. But, uh, I think we did. I think we started fixing <laughs> tests that were slow and getting yeah, rid of them. It's like, okay, maybe we don't even need this test. This is not to test to get anything. Because yeah. what are th what else are six engineers going to do for two minutes when they're waiting? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. You can write a new test while you do that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, we so uh, we had we're, we're kind of uh, need to move on from time here. So uh, digital by default, can you maybe explain a little bit more about that and um, how you worked in the digital environment and how it affected your mob programming experience? Yeah, so I, I like digital by default is kind of a new mantra for Shopify. We, we've all, all working remotely, obviously in, in a digital world. Um, and so yeah, like tools become even more critical. Um, I, I, I do remember, though I don't think it had much success, I really liked some of the, the tools that we tried to develop for teams to collaborate more, one, one of which I, I really liked it was the, it kind of simulated a hallway, and so then that you might like bump into people and have coffee chats, but then you couldn't control when it happened, it would happen at any time during the day, and so, so you'd be working, <laughs> and you'd be, you'd be in your zone, and then suddenly like, oh, I'm having an impromptu coffee chat with someone. Um, but yeah, just like it's, it's interesting to see how uh, we, we've shifted to that new digital model. Um, and I think the tooling is only getting better and better for, for our teams. Um, and, and in terms of how it impacted mobs, um, I would say uh, we included in, in the blog, we had put like a like a git commit script. So we would actually, um, during that 10 minutes of, of driving, once you'd finished, you would run the commit and then someone else would pull and, and start off. And sometimes like that was kind of like the lead time. It almost felt like uh, I've been like in Formula One or like if you're doing a relay race, it was like, how quick can you get it up and the next person can, can go off and start. So it was it was fun. Um, but yeah, I think there, there does seem to be some challenges um, as we're moving to this new domain uh, that we need to solve, yeah. Nice, nice. I had a lot of things easier. Um, sorry, Austin. Did you want to go? go? No, please. Yeah. No, I found a lot of things easier. Like in offices, even pairing, because you'd grab somebody and you'd go into a, a room and there's a door, you close the door, and nobody else knows that you're pairing unless they walk by. But now with Slack, I can see all the different pairings and join completely random ones. I don't know if I would have walked into a random pairing room before. Uh, to see what people were pairing on. So I actually find pairing and mobbing easier uh, on, on, in digital by default world than I did if it was in person. It's much harder to join real live group of people, physical bodies and, and walk in versus click join in a Slack call and passively see and then be involved. It's kind of fun that way. Especially yeah. behind a closed door, right? So if two people are pairing in a room in an office that has a closed door, it's like impossible because you don't know if they're meeting or whatever. Yeah, yeah, you have no There's idea. There's no ambiguity in this situation. No, yeah, there the, isn't. Yeah, the, the accessibility, I've really enjoyed going remote. Um, I mean, I, I think I like remote more for work-life balance reasons. You know, I can go see my wife and 
kids, you know, on breaks. And, you know, it's just, yeah. it's just fantastic for that reason. But also, you know, there was one mobbing session uh, in particular where uh, we, we were troubleshooting a, a, a tough problem that basically required a lot of tribal knowledge. And so it was basically just bringing more and more and more people into the mob until we solved it. And I think it was like, it was starting to span states and uh, organizations. So by we solved it in about 40 minutes, but in the last 10 minutes, I think we added two or three people to the call who are like in different organizations, different states, different countries. And the last person had the final thing and then we fixed it, you know what I mean? And so it was like, you know, in person that would have been more challenging to <laughs> just keep, I mean, I guess you could call them into the mob and things like that, but uh, it, was, it was, that was a, Fun experience and maybe um maybe with the digital by default in mind um how, how do you guys uh prototype I mean, maybe tell us a little bit more about that how do we prototype uh, I, could, I could talk a little bit about that yeah. <laughs> yeah just um a lot of our projects and our team are, are in prototype phase at the moment um so we, we i really like the structure that we have in in terms of our development cycles we have a, a dedicated time for trying to figure out like how are we going to solve this problem? What are the alternative ways in which we can do that? Hence prototyping. But I, I like that our teams have, have structured it in a way that the code that we're creating is of sufficient quality that if we did want to escalate that into, hey, this is actually going to be our candidate to become a pilot or uh, an MVP, um, that could easily be done. Um, and, and trying to bring that prototyping into the mob setting, it, um, it's nice because you're able to filter out some of the spaces you can quickly identify which of these things are going to work and which are not um, and and proceed it's really really uh, useful interesting ours is different definitely a prototype oh, yeah. is a is a proof of concept with the full expectation that this will be thrown out so so don't don't touch it up and it probably should break a thousand tests uh, so that's the interesting that your team no, is it, uh, is opposite it, it does it, of course it still breaks tests but i i, I want to say that it's it's still good enough in quality that we could bring it in and then adjust accordingly. Yeah. Interesting. I think, wow. No, ours is the prototyping that I've seen has been a lot of um, answering the question, will this, can I delete this? Let's delete this. Let's delete this and this and this. Uh, <laughs> and here, here's a functioning prototype. If you didn't have these pieces or add these pieces, it works. Like definitely a, a proof of concept. Uh, to sometimes explore the domain and, and learn more about the domain. Uh, but yeah, it, maybe it's just the kind of projects that have you have. I don't, I don't know. Uh, very amusing. And I think, I, I think prototyping is really important. And I like how you explicitly identify it when you're doing it. Um, and uh, Chris might have to correct me how I'm saying this here, because this is kind of more your MO, but like discovering unknowns and known unknowns and, you know, all that thing, right? You want to like, I think you, what you say, Chris, uh, prioritize bugs and discovering unknowns first, right? When you're doing yeah, it. It's, um, so yeah, it's there's, if you have, if you have like kind of a chart with uh, um, risk versus knowns, right? And so if, if all priorities are equal, meaning that you can, you, if you had all of this together, then you could release it. And if you had any one piece missing, you couldn't release it, then you always prioritize by the highest risk, highest unknown. And so, um, so then in prototyping, uh, typically what we do is we just target those high risk, high unknowns, um, prove them out, and then and then as they become proven, then um, then you know you can either decide to bring it into the fold or or throw it away and and, and work from the beginning. Um, but uh, and I think also what you're referring to is this idea that you know when you're doing something new, when, when you're about to start working on something you have the, the knowns, which are things that you've done before, right? And then you have the known unknowns, uh, but there's actually three categories of known unknowns. There's known unknowns that you've never done them before, but, some, but you know someone else has, right? Um, which might be a library that somebody's used to do something. Uh, and then there's the, the um, known unknown, we've never done it before and no one else has. Right. And then there's also the known unknown of uh, a third party developer or like an API developer. We've never done it before. And the developer regularly changes their API. So we don't know what problems will, will end up happening or what the relationship will be like. And so there's like the relationship unknown. Right. 
And so those kind of end up driving a lot of our proof of concepts. Yeah. yeah. It's the discovery of the knowns and unknowns, right? That's yeah. what kind of a prototype is. Yeah. And it's great to get those discovered because we've been doing a lot more kind of innovative R and D lately. And it, it, it is tempting to just focus on the knowns and start building stuff, you know, but to really go after those and say like, okay, here's this grand vision, but can it really work? Like, and just keep chasing those. And like you said, you might be making code that breaks a bunch of stuff or you hide it behind a feature flag and try to do it in a way where it doesn't break other stuff. But to, to find that out early is much better than late. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So how do you, I guess, how do you um, design your prototype experiments? And it sounds like you both are on different teams. So maybe we'll go one after the other. Cause you, you know, you were talking about, um, you know, do, is it, is it formal? Is it more informal? Do you say like, here are the things we're seeking to discover? Is it like a, is it like a identifiable phase in time, like a sprint or something? Um, or is it more like scope box in a story? And maybe we'll start with you, Sheldon. Yeah. Yeah. So, so often we will um, do a, a set of prototyping to formalize what we would like to build in the end. And, and through that process, we will have created a whole technical design document to try and figure out like, this is this is exactly what we want to build. And here are the limitations that we encountered during the prototyping. Um, it doesn't necessarily have like a, a, a fixed length. It's just however much time is needed for that, that particular project. And then I would say that the, uh, the prototyping itself, when we're looking at it, we would try and identify just like, similar to what you said, like the, the unknowns, unknowns. We, we would try and target something of that we'd like to learn specifically from that. So from a recent project was how could we figure out the, uh, the most optimal way to query some, some data. And we actually went through three or four different prototypes to determine that. And those prototypes actually then became, they, they then became experiments to just verify in, in a production environment, how is that going to work? So just understanding how fast uh, we, can, we can query. And then that would then be uh, publicized in our tech doc. And then from that, we would then decide which, which one gives us the best pro cons um, and, then, and then go from there. Yeah, saying so different. We work in the same work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, prototype. It's the prototype phase. Often starts with like, okay, how much time investment do we want to make to discover what are the knowns and the unknowns are? It's like, okay, where let's let's give it four weeks. Go go figure out what you can figure out in the four weeks, and hopefully you end up either tech design in the end. But sometimes you don't, and that that's okay too. But at least that's a tripwire for us to say. Um, is it worth investing more time into this? Is it more complicated than we had expected? Or is it as simple as we had expected? Or is it what we expected, period, right? And then that can sometimes extend a prototype phase or lead to build. And that's kind of, end of prototype is often where we'll discover scope as well and refine scope. It's like, oh yeah, we've, we've learned that these things are really complicated or not worth doing right now or not worth investing or need more investment. Um, but these things are completely doable. So let's focus on those. And they have high merchant impact, right? So prototype is a lot of discovery as well, uh, but definitely time boxed because uh, it, is, it is not that it is a sprint or anything like that. It's more like how much investment do we want to put in here and then work backwards from that? Uh, and then that helps decide the next steps. Sometimes a prototype can lead to uh, even like broader company wide missions because that's just what made sense. And sometimes it's like, okay, not, not something we're investing in. And sometimes it's just cool. Like, uh, like we did a really, um, we did a smaller project recently, which was just doing something simple as a simple uh, as a Ruby three upgrade. It's like, okay, uh, cause we like to stay up to date. It's like, okay, is what what is gonna happen here? Because we have all these gems and dependencies and discovering even those, does it make sense? And then teams pushing back, okay, we can't get rid of this dependency yet. Can you wait two months? And it's like, okay, what are we going to do and not gonna do on, uh, on that makes sense. And yeah, that, that's kind of what prototyping is for our team. It's great. I, I find it funny how we've got different processes, yeah. but that just, that goes to Shopify's mentality of like the teams can self-form and figure out how we, we approach our problems and it's great to see. I can see the mirror side of, of, of that prototyping and I'm sure that we would do it at some point as well, but that's really interesting. 
You know, I find um, one thing that uh, uh, this kind of reminds me a practice that we started doing because we, we we have the same phenomena happen where people on different teams don't you know uh, don't have these these projects uh, or they don't have the same processes and they have really good ideas. And so what we do is we have cross team lean coffees. We we just do a lean coffee with one member from each of the teams, and then randomly they they start talking about different practices that they do that are, is not done yet on the other team and then also we have uh we've in the past we haven't done this in a while but a diffusion of innovation meeting where it's like talk about what talk about a practice that your team started doing recently that you thought was really effective in front of all the other teams and um and so then it's just up to them to try it out but it's been it's a really good like especially if you have a lot of teams it's a really great way to just get a diffusion of innovation start starting to happen um, but I think uh, with that, we are uh, essentially running out of time here. Um, so uh, I just wanted to ask if uh, either of you had anything that you wanted to uh, plug or share before we, we stopped. So Swati, do you have anything that you wanted to, um, to mention, plug, share, anything like that? No, Shopify is hiring, lots of hiring, and uh, onboarding happens through mobbing in many teams. So shipping team with Shopify folks. DM me, my email, LinkedIn, anything. All right. And Sheldon, how are you? Yeah, that's that's great. <laughs> you just <laughs> my one. Uh, no, I would say uh, it's been it's been interesting to transition to the digital world. And um, the one thing that I would say is that uh, it's kind of equal the playing field. We had a lot of, of Shopify folk who were working remotely already. And so now actually bringing us all into that digital world has, has made us all kind of understand the pros, the frustrations. And I think it's been overall a net benefit for, for Shopify. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that we can expand mob programming further afield, maybe even into non-programming fields. Um, and it'll be super exciting. Hopefully we can come back and explain uh, what we do next. All right, fantastic. And uh, to all our viewers and listeners out there, uh, if you know somebody that's struggling with pull requests or or maybe they're struggling with migrating to remote or or the digital world then maybe you can uh, share this episode with them and make sure that they get the benefit of this experience and uh, with that please like and subscribe and we'll see you all next time thank you very much and bye everybody